I'm Jack Robinson, Sr. of the Nashville Bar. Today is December the 6th, 2000. We're in Nashville at the law firm of Gullett, Sanford, Robinson, and Martin. Today it's my privilege to have an extended conversation with Val Sanford, also of the Nashville Bar, about his career as a lawyer. Val, the primary purpose of our discussion is to focus on your experience as a practicing lawyer in Tennessee. But before getting into that, it's important that we have biographical and other background information on you, and we'll try to wind that in, uh, in, in the various phases that we'll be talking about here today, perhaps in chronological order. So just as you have been request, just as you've requested of others whose depositions that you have taken over the year, uh, throughout the years, give us your full name and the date and place of your birth. William Valerius Sanford, Jr., Ripley, Tennessee, August 25, 1923. Now, where did a name like Valerius come from? My great-grandfather was named Valerius. He was born in 1828 which was a time when classical names or biblical names were favorites. And Valerius, um, well, he's named for Publius Valerius Poplicola, the founder of the Roman Republic. And I've always said that I'm grateful that I didn't get the whole thing. Well, what, what were you called growing up? Were you called Valerius? No, oh, heavens no. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I, I was called, and I'm still called by my family, Mike. And why Mike? Well, I was, um, the story goes, as I understand it, uh, I was given that name before birth. Uh, that is, I was a healthy kicker, and my father said that I needed a mule's name. And if I'd been female, my name would have been Mabel, but fortunately, um, being male, well, Anyway, Mabel probably wouldn't have stuck, but um, he did not, uh, then after I came along, uh, he didn't feel like calling me Bill because my first cousin who lived up the street was Bill, and uh, he didn't want to call me Val because the, the uh, uh, practice would have been to call me Little Val or Val Jr or something of that sort, and um, so Mike stuck. And a few select friends in Nashville still call you Mike. Yeah, well, those who've known me since I was in law school or thereabouts, or who've known me through my wife. All right, tell me a little something about your family. What did your father do? My father was a doctor. Um, in, R in Ripley? He, he started out, well, I'll get a little background for him. He, his father was a doctor, and um, he went to VMI, graduated from VMI, and then went to the Vanderbilt Medical School. And then after the First World War, and after interning at the Philadelphia General Hospital, he went in with his father practicing medicine in Ripley. He was always interested in rural health, however. And in 1929, he, after his father had died, he decided that uh, he would accept an offer from the Commonwealth Fund to uh, enter the public health uh, service in Tennessee uh, with particular emphasis on rural health. Sounds like your family was one of physicians. Were there any lawyers in your family? Yes. Um, I had three uncles who were lawyers, but um, they, there's a picture of the Lauderdale County Medical Society on my office wall, um, and it has about 20 people in it, and five of them are Sanfords. So being a doctor, I, I really was expected to be a doctor. Do you have any siblings? <coughs> Do you have any, any sisters or brothers? 
I had a brother, a younger brother, who um, was about four years younger than me, but who was never well and died. So I've basically been raised as an only child. All right. So you started to school in Ripley, Ripley yes. being in West Tennessee and Lauderdale County? Yes. On the Mississippi River. Yes. Uh, what memory do you have of the first grade, for instance, in, in Ripley? Oh, I have many memories of the first grade. My teacher was Miss Kennedy Wood, who had taught my father in the first grade. Uh, Obviously, she had tenure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we went, went to the, what was called the little school. Um, and one of the things that I remember very well, very much about that, was a, a little girl sat behind me named Joy Robertson. And she would take her knuckles and run them up the back of my head. And I would turn around and swat her. And Miss Cornelia never punished Joy. That, that she concerned punished you? me. <clears throat> and she told me, until she beat it in me. Boys don't hit girls. Now, I don't know what's happened to that uh, over the years, but that was, uh, um, you know, so ingrained that I still think it would be impossible for me to hit a girl. Do you think that pronouncement would be politically correct today? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Well, let me ask you, we've talked about your father a little bit. What about your mother? My mother, was Mary Alice Savage. She was the daughter of Marion Francis Savage, called Frank. Uh, and um, she was born in 1900. Um, would have been 100 years old um, just this last month. Um, she um, went to Bernal in Georgia uh, to school. Um, and um, married my father when she was 23. Okay. So uh, you went to the first grade in the little school in Ripley. Yes. Uh, and then, uh, am I correct that you moved away from Ripley at some point? Yes. That it was at that point that my father uh, went to work for the uh, public health department. Uh, he went. He, the Commonwealth Fund was uh, supporting uh, rural public health efforts, <clears throat> and they uh, had a model uh, program in Murfreesboro. So my father uh, went to, we moved to Murfreesboro, uh, where uh, he worked for the health department, and I went to what was called the training school, now the campus school of what is now MTSU. Was that a traumatic move for you as a first or second grader? Or do you recall that? Yes, I recall it very well. Uh, my family on both sides all the way back, as far as I can recall, uh, had settled in the southwestern part of uh, Tennessee when it was opened up in the 1820s. And living in Ripley, where my father and grandfather and uncles, one of my uncles, Paul Savage, was mayor, for example, we were, <clears throat> I was identified. Um, I had a place in the world. When we moved to Murfreesboro, uh, I no longer had a sense of belonging in that same way. Well, did that affect you as a student? No, I don't think it had any effect on me as a student. So how long did you go to school uh, in Murfreesboro? Well, I went, and, see, started school in 29, went to first grade in, in Ripley, then went to the second grade in Murfreesboro, uh, and then uh, they, they said I was so smart that I needed to skip the third grade. And then we moved to Baltimore, where my father Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, Maryland. Well, my father was taking a public health course at Johns Hopkins, and um, uh, I was in the fourth grade then in Baltimore. Well, was that a traumatic move for you? Oh, yeah, you can imagine. Uh, 
but you know, we rode, I rode the streetcar to school and, and to the movies on Saturday, which was an integral part of my life. What did your classmates think about this Southern boy? I don't remember much about that. I remember what I thought <laughs> about them, and that is I was concerned, being very much Southern, uh, to be in the midst of what I suspected were Yankees. <laughs> and my, my father, my, my closest friend up there was a boy named Stan. I think his name probably was Stanislaus, but anyway, Stan. And I expressed some concern to my father about uh, Stan, and he assured me that Stan was not a Yankee, that he was a Hungarian, <laughs> that his people uh, lived in Hungary in the time of the war, and that he was sure that the Hungarians, any Hungarian, would have been sympathetic with the South because the Austrians had always persecuted the Hungarians. <laughs> and, and so it was all perfectly, I became convinced, it was perfectly all right to associate with Stan because he wasn't a Yankee, he was a Hungarian. So after your year, spending in the fourth grade in uh, Baltimore, you moved back to, uh, Murfreesboro to Murfreesboro and completed elementary school there? Yes. Um, then, did you start the high school in Murfreesboro? Yes, I went, finished the eighth grade at the training school and then uh, went to the old Central High School in Murfreesboro, which burned down in about 1942, but anyway. What courses in high school did you particularly like? English and history. Mm -hmm. I had, um, and I think that's a very significant part of my background in that I had a great interest in chemistry particularly. I had uh, out in the garage a, uh, an elaborate for, me, for a young person chemistry set. They weren't, it was very easy to buy most anything you wanted to buy. And so we would make uh, all kinds of stink bombs and. Uh, other great things, uh, but in high school, my math and science teachers were not nearly as good or as interesting as my English and history teachers. So my interests were more directed in that direction. You remember a favorite teacher or one that influenced you? Well, I remember uh, almost all of my teachers. Um, Miss Sarah Reeves was one of my English teachers. And Miss Cantrell was speech teacher. And public speaking, uh, I, the fact that I took public speaking and participated in the National Forensic League. Um, you were in I the NFL, were you? What? You were in the NFL, were you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, was, uh, uh, also was a very important part of my background. So you graduated from Murfreesboro Central High School, and then you were confronted. What choice to make in going well, to college? Well, this was, was in, this was in June 1940, and I was still going to be a doctor, and I was still... Um, Why was that? Because your doctor, because your I father was, just, and your grandfather was? I assumed that I was going to be a doctor. Okay. Um, and. I, I don't remember now what the, what the process was, but I was going to Vanderbilt. Came down here, or up here from Murfreesboro to uh, uh, some fraternity parties um, in the summer. But it was evident that uh, the world was gonna change, that we were gonna be in uh, the world, we were gonna have a you know, the World, World War. War had started in September 1939, though it hadn't started in earnest. It had gotten way in, in earnest to the West, anyway. Um, so, in July, sometime, I decided that I would go to VMI. I guess you couldn't do that now. That's where your father had gone. Where my father had gone. I had never seen the place. Really knew very little about it. But uh, where is that located? In Lexington, Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, um, uh, you know, did you did got you... on the train in Murfreesboro and changed trains in um, in Chattanooga and 
and went all the way on by train, uh, changing a couple of more times before we got to uh, Lexington. Did it ever cross your mind at that time that you might be a lawyer instead of a doctor? No, I, I hadn't really thought about being. I was going to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. So you enrolled at VMI, which was a military school? Very much. Uh, how did you warm up to the military tradition? Well, I, I would have to admit that I wasn't a particularly good cadet. I got more than my share of demerits. But that place, uh, you know, it was all male that time, right? Oh, well, definitely. Yeah. And um, you, you, they, they, they instill uh, certain basic attitudes, loyalty and duty and honor. That uh, Do you find those? You don't. I mean, even a sorry cadet like me, um, that became a part of me. Not that that wasn't already a part, a substantial part of me anyway, because that was a part of the patriarchal culture that I grew up in. How long did you stay at VMI? Until uh, June 1943. Then what happened? After the war broke out, they put us on active duty but left us in school. Um, then in June 1943, they sent us to our respective training centers. I like to say when somebody asks me about my service in the war, oh, I started in the horse cavalry, which is true because when I was on active duty in VM at VMI, I was in the horse cavalry. Uh, so I went out to Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, they'd abolished the horse cavalry by that time, and uh, we were in tanks. Uh, bouncing over the hot Kansas plains, um, Several of us looked up in the sky, and uh, those airplanes looked so cool. So we transferred to the aviation cadet program. You're talking about looking up in the sky, and those airplanes look so cool. Go back a little bit. Let me ask you, where were you when Pearl Harbor occurred? We were, I was at BMI when Pearl Harbor on that Sunday. Remember it very vividly. Remember uh, marching to the mess hall. Uh, chanting to hell with Tokyo. Were you confident at that time that you'd be part of the war? Oh, I knew I was going to be part of the war before there was a war. That yeah. was the whole idea of going to VMI. All right, we've got up to the point that you got in, I guess we call it the U.S. Army Air Corps, isn't that correct? Well, uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah. It was known as, in, yeah. in those days. Yeah, I went out to Santa Ana, um, California classification center. Of course... Uh, what, was, what was your job in the Air Force? What did you do in the Air Force? What was your job? Well, um, I'm beginning to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, having been in the uh, um, uh, in the horse cavalry and, and thinking of ourselves as, uh, uh, you know, Bedford Forrest and Jeb Stewart types, uh, um, uh, I thought, and I think most of the rest of them, my group thought that we would be fighter pilots. Well, we didn't take into account the fact that we'd had calculus and um, had uh, some basic mathematical skills. So we were almost all navigators. And I went to Ellington Air Force Base then uh, for navigational training. What kind of airplane did you serve on? B-29. Uh, were you only in this country or did you go abroad? Went abroad after the war was over. Um, that is, as the war was ending, really, we, in early August of um, 1945, we flew from California uh, ultimately to Tinian. Well, let me ask you, did you pick up from your Army career, your Army service, any pointers that would help you in life? Oh, many pointers. Give me an example. Many, many, many pointers. One of the first ones was on that trip from Fort Riley to Santa Ana. Um, of course, being on a troop train, uh, you gambled. And I lost all my money before we got to the Colorado border. And 
I learned a very important lesson then that I wasn't supposed to gamble. And I have never then been attracted to gambling ever since that experience. So that's a positive for the Army. Are there any others? Well, then, then when we were uh, flying the B-29s, we were stationed down in uh, Puerto Rico, and they couldn't get the airplanes, new, relatively new airplanes. They couldn't get them to flying. So we wouldn't, the crew members wouldn't have anything to do. Um, beautiful uh, officers club looking over the blue Caribbean, a beautiful golf course. Uh, so we might play golf in the morning, or we might go into town for a, a cockfight. This went on for a couple of weeks and it was great, but uh, after about six weeks, we were so exasperated and put out with that, we were about ready to transfer to the infantry, anything to get out of there. So what I learned was, there's nothing worse than enforced idleness, and I will never want to retire where I don't have something that I have to do. All right, so you learned that in the Army. Right. Come out of winter there. Any others that you recall? Well, um, yeah, the, 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 as I say, there were a number of... I remember you telling me at one time about uh, the long voyage back. Oh, ship. sure. That, that, I learned there that I didn't want to go on any cruises. <laughs> <laughs> From right. Okinawa to San Francisco on a troop ship was a, enough ocean voyage. Now, you were unmarried during the time you were in military service? Yes, I had met my future wife when we were stationed at Great Bend, Kansas, and she was going to school and working in Wichita, Kansas, and we would go into Wichita uh, on the weekend, and that's when I met her. But and what we, is her name? Her name was Betty Bellis, B-E-L-L-I-S. She is from uh, a little town, Oric, O-R-R-I-C-K, which is um, in the Little Dixie re region of um, uh, just this side of Kansas City. So Betty is something else positive that came as a result of your military yes, duty. Yes, that's another, another very much uh, thing that I'm grateful to the military for. All right. Now you were mustered out of the military. And uh, what was on your mind at that time? Well, by that time I was thinking about what I was going to do. I had uh, earlier decided that I didn't like sick folks and I didn't want didn't, to didn't like what kind of folks? Sick folks. Sick folks, all right. And I didn't want to be a doctor. All right. I had not really decided definitely uh, what I wanted to do. Um, I knew that I needed to do something uh, that involved verbal skills. I had also learned early on that my mechanical aptitude was not great, to put it mildly and that I needed to, to do um, something uh, that required the use of language. Now, you couldn't get any guidance from your father on that because he had, been, he had died in the war, isn't that correct? Right. He, my father, um, had, had, you know, the, there's such a difference in attitude um, in that generation and what we have now. Uh, my father served in the First World War, as did my Uncle Paul, and then the Second World War, they both served. My father was in the military government uh, in Italy, and in December 1943, uh, he died of a heart attack. Tom, now, he had given me some advice because I'd already decided before then that I wasn't going to be a About a doctor. career? What did he And he say? had written me about, um, you know, you, 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 you can, you know, I, I had thought that I would be a writer and he was trying to disabuse me of the notion that anyone could make a living or likely be able to make a living. Um, and so he, he wrote me about the various things that I might be able to do where writing skills would be s significant. And of course, law is one of the principal ones of that nature. You mentioned that both you and your father served in World War II. Right. So Tom Brokaw has called that generation the greatest. Uh, you think that's an exaggeration or do you? Yes. <laughs> 
um, I, I, when, when somebody says that my generation is the greatest generation, I can say, well, we sure didn't do a very good job in parenting. Look who, I, who we produced as leaders, Bill Clinton, Newt Gendrick, and so on. <laughs> uh, All right, let me ask you this. You are, you're out of the service now. You've not, you have not completed college. Right. And so what, where, where did you enroll? Well, at that point, I had about decided that I was going to go to law school. And I thought about um, where I might want to practice. Um, and I decided I would want to practice in Tennessee. I had thought about going to the University of Virginia uh, and going to uh, finishing my undergraduate. And I didn't want to go back to VMI. I was seriously contemplating marriage at that point. So anyway, uh, I decided I want to practice law in Tennessee. So I decided to go to Vanderbilt. I went, went to undergraduate school, enrolled in undergraduate school lab uh, in August to September of 1946 and finished undergraduate school and went directly into law school. Then, right, did you and Betty marry while you were in undergraduate school? Yes, we, we got married uh, on February uh, the 27th, 1947. All right, and she's still your wife, isn't that correct? Right, we've been married ever since. All right. Then uh, you, you got your undergraduate degree and you entered Vanderbilt Law School. Right. Uh, tell me about the first day there or the first week where you were. Did you, did you find well, it quite a Well, one of the more memorable things, that this was in the old Kirkland Hall All right. and the uh, law library was in this room which was used to be where they had the assembly. Uh, they had stained glass windows. But anyway, uh, the walls were covered, lined with books, and I was uh, looking at the books, and this young man comes up and says, um, Hi there, I'm Bobby Lee Cook. Can I help you? <laughs> and I thought, well, that's very nice, but it turned out it was his first day, too, and he knew less about the library than I did. But he wasn't lacking on brass and never has been since, um, which is... Not necessarily bring us a up disadvantage to in the practice of law. Bring us up to date. Who is Bobby Lee Cook? Bobby Lee is a, a very prominent uh, lawyer down in North Georgia who is the um, um, model for, oh, what's the law, law, law program that um, Andy Griffith plays the lawyer? Matlock. Matlock, yes. right. Well, that's, let me, all right. When... Um, you weren't intimidated by law school, is it, uh, was that correct? Or, uh, or no, were, I wasn't intimidated uh, by law school. After you'd been there a few weeks, did you figure this is what I want to do for the rest of my life? Or did you have uh, any idea about it? Well, I was already pre pretty much committed to having, having enrolled in the law school and having thought through uh, that that's, so I would say yes. Any particular subjects that you found to be intriguing in law school? Well, it's not so much subjects as teachers. I've always thought that, um, that you take teachers and not subjects, and that there's some people who could be teaching you anything and you would learn, and others who could be teaching the same thing and you would learn very little. Who is one of those super professors that you Well, I, I thought that John Wade, who was then very young, was... Um, um, one of the better teachers that we had. Uh -huh. uh, some of the teachers uh, would get up and lecture. You would take notes. The exam would come. You would read, or you would give them back what they had given you. Wade made you think and organize your material. And you went to Vanderbilt Law School for three years. Well, you went, I went straight through. I started in June of, uh, of 47 and finished in August of 49. Now, let me ask you, when you finished in 1949, you had uh, you'd been in military service, so you had uh, some age on you, and uh, you had a wife to support. Uh, what, what were your thoughts about practice in law? Where did you want to practice? Did you, was it, well, was it a job? Well, I, I, uh, I had thought this through by that time. Uh, I wanted to practice in a 
in a good sized town, size of Murfreesboro, Clarksville, Columbia, uh, Jackson. Um, so I, I went about this in a very, what I considered a very uh, logical manner. I uh, got all the economic indicia that I could find and compared that to the number of lawyers and uh, then picked out uh, five or six or so of the towns of that size that appeared to me to be places where they needed a lawyer. And then um, I relied on my Uncle Paul, uh, primarily, who had contacts all over the state, uh, to uh, uh, give me some suggestions of people to talk to. All right, and then where did you wind up? Well, I'll tell you about how that process worked. Now, yeah. I don't remember who this was. It was some lawyer up in East Tennessee. I don't remember whether it was Athens or Maryville. Um, but anyway, I was talking to him. He wanted to know how, I, why I was there, and I explained to him. And he said that was the dumbest thing he ever heard of, <laughs> that you want to go where they're the most lawyers, not the least. It's lawyers that make law business. There's a measure of truth in that. So that changed your thinking? Well, no, that really didn't change my thinking. What changed my thinking was that I got a call from George Lewis down in Memphis, who was then with Waring, Walker, Carson, Lewis. Um, That's a law firm in Memphis. A law firm in Memphis at that time that uh, um, they would like to talk with me um, how did how they heard about you? I'm not sure. Uh, it, it, I have a vague recollection that they had uh, uh, somehow talked to Charlie Warfield, who had suggested that they talk to me. Let me ask you, was Charlie Warfield in your class at Vanderbilt? Yes. Any other practicing lawyers around today that oh, are in your most, class? Uh, Branstad, Cecil, Cecil Branstad. Branstad. Uh, Bill Harbison was a little bit. He Bill was, Harbison Sr., who's now deceased. Yes. Uh -huh. And... Uh, Oh, there were still several yeah. that era. So uh, you interviewed in Memphis, and what was the oh, result? Uh, I was hired in Memphis um, and went to work down there uh, in August of 1949 um, and really uh, enjoyed that very much. Of course, that was uh, your was part a of good firm. Your part of the state, wasn't it? Your, well, that yes. Was I not was too the, far from Ripley. Yeah, 50 miles south of Ripley, mm -hmm. and um, my mother still lived in Ripley, so that was convenient. But anyway, um, I had good work, um, wrote briefs, argued cases, uh, investigated automobile accidents, the whole business. So, so it was a very uh, General enjoyable experience, and I enjoyed those, those uh, lawyers. Do you recall about what your salary was? Yes, I understand that I had the highest salary of anybody in my law school class, $150 a month and half of what I could bring in. Uh -huh. um, how long did you stay at the Memphis Law Firm? About a year, um, and I guess it would be appropriate to say why I left, because well, I wasn't unhappy. I had no idea of leaving. Well, before we get there, let me ask you, do you recall the first case, the first major case you were involved in, or the first item or matter? Or the, or well, I don't thing remember uh, what would be first. What I've heard uh, you I, say. I remember that one of, the, one of the first things I started working on were fair trade cases representing the whiskey distillers. I remember investigating accidents and um, helping in the trial of defense of accident cases. Uh, but insofar as uh, what the first, uh, mm -hmm. I don't. Well, you were starting to tell me that you'd been there about a year and you'd gotten a call from someone? Well, yes. Uh, now, I'll give you Doug Fisher's version of what happened. Um, Frank Clement had just left the Railroad and Public Utilities Commission, as it was, just, as it was then called, the general counsel there. And he was going to open an office here in Nashville. He was a young man. And he, needed, he needed somebody to do the work. <laughs> uh, and he was a very good friend of George Lewis. And he was talking with George. And George, according to Doug, 
was bragging about this new young lawyer that they'd hired and what a good worker he was and how smart he was and all that. And so Frank, according to Doug again, excused himself uh, and proceeds to go to the telephone and call me up. Uh, in any event, I did get a call from Frank Clement uh, wanting me to meet him uh, at his father's place in Dixon uh, and talk about coming to Nashville. Now, I should add that when I was in law school, I had said that I wasn't going to practice law in any city, and if I did, it wouldn't be Nashville. Uh, Nashville at that time, everything was heated by coal. It was filthy, ill-governed. There wasn't any, uh, any progressive aspect to it at all. Memphis, on the other hand, was efficiently governed uh, and uh, clean and, and had attracted a lot of new industry. And it shows how quickly things mm -hmm. can change because at that point, uh, the future looked much brighter in Memphis than it did in Nashville. Well, despite your reservations, was Clement persuasive? Yes. The uh, fact is, we started to, my wife and I started to turn around and not even come up here and call him and tell him we weren't interested. Uh, but we, having made the commitment to come, we came on and met Frank at his father's house in Dixon and uh, talked to him for a while. And, uh, you know, being number two and higher than number seven, and um, I knew enough about Frank to know that he was going to be a political comer and um, uh, that we ought to have a good good future. So uh, I agreed to come to Nashville. There were seven in your law firm in Memphis? I there were seven members? Yeah, I was the seventh. Uh -huh. Big firm. Now, for the record, uh, tell us what happened to Frank Clement ultimately. Well, what happened was uh, the Korean War and uh, I had been active in the reserve, and there was some question as to whether I would get called to active duty. Frank hadn't been active in the reserve. Um, he was in the reserve, but, but he got called to active duty in September after I had come up here in July. Uh, so there I was left with the office. Um, fortunately, uh, he had some good friends, clients, uh, Herschel Greer, for example, uh, who gave us title business, and uh, uh, some of the motor carrier people who gave us some motor carrier business that we um, uh, could continue to pay the rent and eat. What was the name of the firm at that time that you started? It was, still, it was called Clement and Clement, Mr. Robert Clement, who still was down in Dixon. And That's Frank's father? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there would be three of you in the firm, counting, right. counting um, Clement in, uh, from Dixon. Uh, how long did um, you and Frank Clement and, uh, and uh, his father continue to practice together? Well, we, we continued to practice together. Frank was elected governor, of course, in, in 52 and went into office in January of 53, uh, and he uh, stayed in as governor until 59, uh, January 59. Uh, there was no more Clement and Clement. Mr. Robert and I basically shared the office space, but it didn't really change the way we, we um, operated. I've heard it said that um, Frank Clement was pretty good about getting the business in and that Val Sanford was pretty good about getting the business out. Think that's a valid class, a valid well, statement? Well, uh, certainly that's the way it started out. Um, Any uh, memorable cases that you were involved in during that period? I suppose the most memorable case that that, uh, that I had during that period, uh, certainly in the early days of that period, was. Uh, Frank had a friend who called him one day and said he, he wanted him to talk with this woman. Um, and this was Bishop Maddie Lou Jewell, the true chief overseer of the house of God, which is the church of the living God and without controversy. The pillar and ground of the truth and without controversy, um, which comes from a passage in 1 Timothy. Uh, and Bishop Jewell, uh, was an interesting person. Did she think and that you could, controversy? Did she think you could help her? 
Mm -hmm. Did she think you could help her? Oh, yes. Well, what? Of course we did. We needed the money <laughs> that she had. But anyway, um, the, um, the she had been involved in litigation since 1933, uh, litigation over who was had the right to control the holy ground of the church out on Hammond Street where they would held, hold their general assemblies. Hammond Street in Nashville? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't want me to get started on this story because it's so complex I could talk for two hours about it without stopping. But I will tell one story. I tell you, I, I know that story, but tell me about the ending of it. About the well, federal, let me tell you about the one Miller. story about the, the, um, uh, the fee, which is a good lawyer's story. All right. Frank and I had discussed um, uh, what we ought to charge her. We were going to bring a case in the federal court to get it out of the Chantry Court. So we agreed that uh, we'd charge her $2,500 for taking the case in the United States District Court, uh, which seemed to me to be a reasonable fee. There's a lot of money in 19, 1950. Um, so we're sitting there, and after we discuss it and discuss the case, uh, and Frank says, now, Bishop, uh, uh, of course, we'll have to charge you a, 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 a substantial fee in order to take on a matter of this complexity. And she says, uh, yes, lawyers, I knows about lawyers, which she did. <laughs> and and, and uh, so Frank says, uh, uh, Mr. Santa, I think that an appropriate fee would be $5,000. He just doubled what we had had agreed on. I about fell over. Bishop Jewell said, do you want it all today? <laughs> and, and, but anyway, uh, skipping over to the end of it, the end of it was that uh, the, the, um, in the 60s, when the I-40 went through out there in North Nashville, uh, they took the back end of the property. Bishop Jewell had built a school and uh, we'd kept her in possession all these years. And the result was that we were back before Judge Miller, and he, he, he uh, ordered that Bishop Jewell allow these other people, the other claimants to the chief overseership, uh, to come on the property. And That's Judge William Miller in the, in the uh, yes. federal court here. And she, she, she was outraged at that, that she would sow the place in salt. And um, then finally she said, that judge going to take over this church. We just elect him the chief overseer. <laughs> well, I've always regretted that they didn't do that because I could see this delegation of elderly, black, very dignified bishops calling on Judge Miller to advise him that he had been elected the chief overseer. That's a good story. Now, after Frank Clement was elected governor, did you practice alone during that period? Uh, yes. Well, Mr. Robert and I shared the office, but we were mm -hmm. we no longer had the firm. Then Frank Clement served as governor for was it six years? He served the first time for six years. Well, first time he was the first. He was the last two year and the first four year governor. Right. Constitutional Convention. Then did, you, did you and Clement reconstitute the firm after his Yes, uh, after retirement? when he came out in 59, uh, we formed a new firm of Clement, Sanford, and Fisher. That's Doug Fisher. And uh, how long did you practice uh, with, um, with Clement and Fisher? We, we practiced until uh, Frank went back in office in um, 1963. January 1963. And did you have a general law practice at that time? Yes. Now, he, when he went back uh, into office in 1963, did you subsequently get a call or an invitation to, to join another firm? Yes. Um, Tom Steele, who was a friend of mine from Ripley, his father and uncle, uh, their law office, was above Miss Ada Daly's store on one side, and 
my father and grandfather's doctor's office was on the other side above Miss Ada Daly's store. Uh, we had known one another since early childhood. Tom was 18 months older than me, so we never had been really close, but we had known one another, and we had, after I finished law school and he came up here, we often talked about practicing law together. Uh, we did do some things together. And then when Harry Phillips was appointed to the uh, Court of Appeals, um, Tom asked me to join him and be gullet in forming this successor firm of, of um, Gullet Steel and Sanford, which is what we did effective uh, about the 1st of July, 1963. Now, Tom Steele, that's Thomas Wardlaw Steele, he had been a young chancellor in Davidson County, isn't that yes, correct? Yes, he had been chancellor in the middle 50s. Mm -hmm. And B.B. Gullet had uh, run for mayor at one time, isn't that correct? Now, he ran for Congress. For I don't Congress. Think B, B ever ran for mayor. Oh, that's he right. Ran for Congress. That's right. He ran for Congress. And so, he'd been very active politically. I'd known B because B was a big supporter of Frank Clements. Mm -hmm. So I'd known B um, from the political and legislative standpoint. Did you ever have any interest of uh, being a part of the government? Well, I guess if somebody had appointed me United States Senator, I might have served at that. Uh, I learned early on, another one of my early lessons was that uh, uh, running for office is hard work and not very rewarding work. Uh, and I decided that while it, politics is very interesting and I enjoy watching and participating, I don't want to run. You were never tempted to hold I public office, is that right? I never considered running for any office. Now let me ask you this. You had close affiliations with uh, those on the political scene, both state and federal, and was thought of very favorably by those. Uh, I often wondered, why didn't you want to serve as a judge at some point? Because I know it would have been well, possible. Well, I guess there's several reasons for that. Uh, one was that I had become friends with Judge Sam Phelps, uh, who was then on the Court of Appeals. And I would be up in the Supreme Court Library uh, researching on some, preparing to write some brief, and would go up and visit Judge Phelps. And he was always so delighted to see me or see anybody. Uh, you know, I, I observed that being an appellate judge particularly is a very lonely life. You're isolated from your former uh, colleagues to a considerable extent. Uh, and also, I knew enough about my own personality um, to know that uh, I'm basically an advocate, and my opinions would probably have read like Joe Henry's. Um, the, um, but I guess maybe the most important reason was they didn't pay the judges enough for me to educate my children on. All right. So in, on July 1st, 1963, the firm became Gullet, Steele, and Sanford. And by that time, you and Betty had three children. Well, who, who are your children? It, we had, uh, my older daughter Mary was born in 1952. My next daughter, Elizabeth, was born in 54, and my son, Will, was born on June the 3rd, 1963. All right, so here you were constituting a new law firm, the uh, father of uh, three growing children, and uh, what was the economics of law practice, do you recall, back uh, 37 years ago? Well. If a lawyer made $25,000 a year, he was doing very well. Judges were paid. We'd gotten a judge's pay increase up until about that time. They only made $5,000 a year. Um, and I think we'd gotten it up to $7,500, maybe $10,000. I don't remember exactly. But, uh, and still at that you know, time. You know, you, you, a hotel room and a nice, hotel 
would have been $10. And so that, your whole standard of living or your whole pricing level was a tenth of what it is now. It's all relative. The Nashville Bar Association at that time still maintained a minimum fee schedule, isn't that correct? Well, that went, all, went out about that time. Yeah. It did. We had a minimum fee schedule in the 50s, but I don't. I think by the 60s that was out. So in your, in your uh, new law firm, the uh, firm of um, Gullet, Steele, and Sanford, what did you primarily do? Well, at that time, I was representing the Tennessee Bankers Association trying to get the, universal, the Uniform Commercial Code passed in Tennessee and some other banking legislation. I was representing the American Educational Life Insurance Company, uh, which was a new company. We had stock issues, we had securities problems, we had uh, acquisitions and all that sort of thing. I was still doing motor care work before the Public Service Commission. Uh, as it was then called. I was still trying um, an occasional damage suit or whatever. I quit taking divorces <coughs> 10 years before that. Um, I did my, it still have handled uh, in, uh, during that period a few criminal appeals. So I was still doing basically whatever I got hired to do. Well, Val, let me ask you, you'd been practicing law at that point, 14 years. Did you find law practice as challenging and as interesting as you thought you would? Oh, yes, I've always enjoyed the law practice. The sort of work that I've been able to do, uh, which to a considerable extent is dealing in the organization and presentation of ideas, of complex situations, uh, you know, that's what I still do. Now, you know, you've been called over the years the lawyer's lawyer and the judge's lawyer. In fact, when I mentioned the term judge's lawyer, I remember that you represented all the judges at one point. Well, Tell not quite all of them, but a substantial part of them. Uh, it was an, an issue arose with respect to the judicial retirement program and uh, the judicial conference, uh, uh, I don't know whether it was the official judicial conference, but anyway, uh, the judges uh, had a committee that asked me to represent uh, the judges in that controversy, which I did. That was in the middle of the 70s. I think it's always interesting to see the work habits, to learn about the work habits of lawyers. We all work differently. We uh, dictate differently, we write differently, we research differently. How would you summarize your work habits as a lawyer? Well, I guess in part it depends on what I'm working on, but um, a good bit of what I do is writing. Um, I am ashamed to say that I think about a by writing out in hand uh, and then going back through and changing my own handwritten notes, which are illegible most of the time, even to me, I have to remember what it was that I wrote. Which is some indication that you wanted to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> there may be some truth in that. But anyway, I write it out, uh, revise it in the handwritten form, then dictate it. Um, and then um, I don't, usually don't have much revision to what I have dictated. I will make some changes during the process of dictation. Um, I don't mean to embarrass now, you. Know, let me go back to All talk right. about uh, the habits of work because yes. the early years, I think it's important. Now, what I was convinced to do, two things. One, as a matter of self-discipline, to keep time records not for the purpose of charging, but for the purpose of organizing your time and being sure that you spent your time wisely. I still think that is very important. Uh, then the, 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 the whole way of working, when you are presented with some 
new topic. Don't think about, if you can afford it, um, how you're going to charge for this, but master that topic, whatever it is, so that when you've got something, you know what you're talking about. You don't just copy what somebody else did. You don't just rely on what somebody tells you. You know that when you use this word, this is the word to use. Once you have done that, then the next time that problem comes around, uh, you are comfortable in dealing with it. Let me ask you this, and I know the answer and I don't want to embarrass you about it. What days of the week do you come to the, to the law office generally? <laughs> well, I've slacked off, Jack. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I, I don't stay as long on Saturday as I used to, <laughs> but I still come in on Saturday most of the time. And I rarely come in on Sundays anymore. I used to, when I was really busy, um, come in on Sunday afternoon. I know from my experience, uh, you opened up, you closed up daily here on Saturday and usually on Sunday afternoon. Well, you know, the Saturday business, uh, you can remember, the office was open on Saturday. That's right. You worked on Saturday. You wore a hat, too. <laughs> All of those things that, uh, and you had a uh, that habits were developed uh, uh, long ago. And all the men wore ties on Friday, did they not? And wore ties every day, yeah. yeah. Any, um, any views from your standpoint on the changing office attire? And well, I think it's, uh, you know, in large part generational. Uh, this baby boomer generation, our children, um, I guess they had such a happy childhood they never want to grow up. <laughs> um, that seems to me to be largely responsible for the uh, uh, casualness and a lot of the other things of wanting to maintain adolescence forever. But that's probably a, um, a sign of my own age. And Val, knowing the answer of this, I'll have to ask you for the record. Do you practice casual Fridays? No. All right. <laughs> All right. I've, I've, th I've talked about uh, on Sunday coming in in my tux as uh, a matter of protest, but I haven't done that. While you were representing clients' interests through the years at the, the law firm of Gullet, Steele, and Sanford, and its name has changed somewhat through the years, but you're still at the same law firm, isn't that correct? That's right. In addition to representing client interests during that period of time, reaching over oh, 37 years so far, uh, you also held some important positions. Uh, for instance, I know that uh, you were chairman of the Tennessee Law Revision Commission from 1963 to 1969. Uh, tell us a little bit about what was done during that time. Well, I'll tell you about that and how that got started. Uh, Frank Clement was going to have to make a speech and this would have been in December 1962 to the Nashville Bar Association. Uh, and he, you know, he was going into office as governor in January, and so the Nashville Bar Association asked him to be the principal speaker at the annual meeting in December. And Frank turned to Doug Fisher and me and said, you boys write me a speech. So we flipped, and I lost, and I had to write the speech. Well, I had a lot of ideas about what, you know, if I were going to be governor, what I would have proposed. Uh, so um, I wrote him a fine speech, and one of the things in that speech was the, you know, we were going to raise judges' pay. We were going to, uh, <coughs> we were going to have. Uh, a, uh, an executive secretary to the Supreme Court to help in the administration of the courts. Uh, we were going to uh, um, um, create a law revision commission to study uh, reforming the corporation code, uh, administrative law, the rules of practice and procedure, and court reform. Uh, 
Um, all of these things, uh, closing with, that, that's all in the speech, and closing with uh, uh, those, uh, the great uh, quotation, I don't remember who it comes from now, um, uh, Caesar Augustus found Rome a city of brick, but he left it a city of marble. How much nobler it would be to find Tennessee, a, a state where the legal system was in disarray, and to leave it where we had brought into being a legal system worthy of our people. Now, that's not a quote that's, that's exactly, the, but something like that. That's the kind of quote. And you know, the Nashville Bar Association just thought it was a great speech. Clement, I don't know whether he had even read it before he gave it, but, but anyway, he was then committed to it. So, and he followed through. Uh, we had a, uh, he put in his legislative package, and in those days, the governor's legislative package was passed. Wasn't any question about it. And uh, so we had the Law Revision Commission. So and he, we proceeded then to um, do a good many of the things. We had a, they finally got the Corporation Code in 69 uh, and got the rulemaking power in the Supreme Court. Um, fought a noble battle for the reform of the judiciary, but lost that. Is the Law Revision Commission still in being today? No, the Law Revision Commission passed out. I, I left in 69 and then in the early 70s when the legislature was uh, uh, reorganizing its staff, uh, uh, they decided to take over those functions. What was your position on the Law Revision Commission? I was the chairman. Throughout the whole time of its existence? Yeah, th throughout the, not the whole time of its existence, the whole time I was on it. Yeah. And the commission would make recommendations for revision in Tennessee law, and yes. that would be submitted to the legislature. Yes. Uh, did you personally do a lot of legislative drafting during that time? Yes, I did uh, some of the uh, some of the legislative drafting. Of course, I'd been drafting bills um, back from the early days of the Clement administration, mm -hmm. um, so I was familiar with the legislative drafting process. And being familiar with the legislative process. Have you done any lobbying as part of your career? Oh, I've done some lobbying. Done more bill drafting, I take it. I, I have, uh, you know, the very first one was in 1953. Uh, Frank Clement had been elected uh, in large measure uh, on, by virtue of attacking the Browning administration for uh, the purchasing uh, problems in that administration, Memorial Hotel deal and some uh, other purchasing s scandals. So the very first thing, one of the very first things in his uh, administration was the adoption of a new purchasing and purchasing procedures for state government. In Clements administration? Yes. Mm -hmm. So he asked me and Tom Steele, and I did most of the work, to uh, draft a new purchasing statute. Of course, neither Tom nor I knew the first thing about purchasing, but yeah, the typical young lawyers, that didn't deter us at all. Uh, I went out to the uh, Vanderbilt Library and read the statutes of other states and, and read text and, and uh, came up with a bill, drafted it, uh, turned it over to Clement, uh, very few changes, uh, it was passed. And some of it is still on the books. Wasn't a bad bill at all. Do you think there's a need to have a law revision commission today or something like it? Oh, I think it would be fine to have it. I doubt that we're ever going to have it. At least uh, the, the legislature is more jealous of its prerogatives. And you have a, have a commission that is not legislative in nature. Um, I don't think it's feasible now. Before we take a break, let me uh, ask you uh, this question involving the Tennessee Board of uh, Bar Examiners. We won't get into that very far, but uh, tell me about your tenure on that and what position you had. Well, I got a call, this must have been about 1979, got a call from Joe Henry, whom I'd known. Now, who's Joe Henry? 
Joe Henry was then on the Tennessee Supreme Court. Right. Now I'd known Joe. Joe had been, he'd been a very active a Clement supporter and been adjutant general and so on. Alaska lawyer, wasn't he? Yes. Before he was on the court. And, and anyway, Joe's on the court. He called me and he said, Sanford, I'm going to appoint you to board as bar examiners. Don't give me any talk about you. got to talk to your partners now. Uh, I know what they'll say. I'm going to appoint you and I want you to serve. So that was really the end of that. I did talk to my partners, but uh, I explained to them that I didn't have a whole lot of choice about it. And uh, so that's how I got named to the board of bar examiners. All right. We'll pick up that story when we come back. Val, we were discussing the Board of Bar Examiners. Let me ask you, do you remember when you took the bar? Uh, and how was the examination different at the time you took it and the way it well, is? Well, we didn't you... have the multi-state in the first place. Uh, Judge Albert Williams, Mr. Charlie Neely, I don't remember who the third one was, but um, Judge Williams presided. We had it in the, uh, I took it in, um, in, January, in February, the winter of uh, 1949, in, the, um, in a room in the old Watkins Institute building. Did you have a bar review course? No. The bar, we, in 1950, um, a number of the Vanderbilt students failed. Um, story was that Mr. Charlie Neely had said, all those boys coming back going to law school on the GI Bill, they don't have no business being lawyers, and, and so proceeded to weed them out, but I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, anyway, it made a good story. Uh, and the dean called uh, me and Bill Harvison and Cecil Brandstutter in and asked us to start a bar review course. So we ran that course uh, up until the, oh, sometime in the 60s. We'd revised the outlines once, and we would, needed to revise them again. Uh, it was just too much trouble. Uh, we were charging, I think we'd gotten our charges up to $60 at that point. Um, and of course, in the early 60s, there weren't all that many people taking the, taking the bar exam. There weren't all that many law students. Was review courses given at night? Yes, we gave the course out at Vanderbilt at night. Val, did you go through Vanderbilt on the GI Bill? Yes. Mm -hmm. When you were on the um, Board of Law Examiners, how many members were there on there? Oh, three. It had been, always been three. And you were the chairman? Uh, uh, well, I didn't start out as chairman, but as president. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was the president. At, uh, I don't remember a lot of part of the time I was on it anyway. How did it feel having in the palm of your hands, the future of uh, these various men and women who had graduated from law school and were taking the Well, I really didn't think about it in those terms. Um, the, 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 the first thing that occurred to me after we got it, after I was on the board and got a little familiar with it was the bar exam questions had gotten too predictable. Um, that is, uh, the, the examiners took the questions from prior exams. Um, the, the people giving the bar review course bragged that they could predict uh, what the questions were going to be. Uh, they never could predict what our questions were going to be. Um, <clears throat> we made sure of that. Uh, and uh, we, we changed, we, we revised the rules. Uh, Change the subject list a little bit, put some procedural requirements in. Um, Did you personally grade the examinations? Yes, we, we had nine helpers, and the three of us and the nine helpers each took a question, an essay question, and graded it. Um, and the grading of the papers was the um, thing that I finally got, just got too tired of doing. Um, so exasperating. Their writing skills were so minimal. 
uh, if you've graded it as uh, I would really have preferred to grade it, only about 10 percent would have passed, but you couldn't possibly uh, get by with that. Now, you were on the uh, Board of Law Examiners from 1979, I believe, to 1986. Did you see any improvement in uh, writing skills during that no, time? No, I don't think they've improved uh, to this day. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the cultural problem. As a member of the board, did you ever get any flack from those who failed to pass? Oh, sure. We got sued. <laughs> uh, who represented you? Attorney General. Uh -huh. Everything come out all right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you've also uh, been involved in other activities. I know that you were uh, the founder and the first president of the Tennessee Supreme Court Historical Society. What's that about? Well, um, Riley Anderson and Frank Travolta, uh, well, uh, Frank called me one day. To, both of them on the Tennessee Supreme yes, Court. And both now. of them justices are, are really judges, you know, that this justice business. is. Constitution says they're judges. There's a chief justice, but the rest of them are judges. But long about in the 70s, early 70s, um, they uh, began to call themselves justices. Um, a story about that, but I won't get into that. I, it sounds intriguing. Won't you, won't you talk <laughs> well, about Some lawyer was before the court and referred to somebody as judge, and he <laughs> remonstrated with him that he was justice. And one of the others uh, allegedly said, oh, that's all right, Mr. So-and-so. Uh, the Constitution agrees with you. <laughs> uh, but now I've gotten off the question. You got the call from two Supreme Court Yeah, justices. I got the, the call to ask them if I wouldn't have lunch with them, which, of course, I was delighted to do. And they um, um, asked me um, if I would be interested in organizing a, 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 a Tennessee Supreme Court Historical Society. There, uh, several of the states had by that time organized such societies. And um, having a lifelong interest in history and in the history of the law in Tennessee, um, I readily agreed to do that. My only regret was, you know, the first thing we were going to do is have a, a book written. And my regret was that I didn't have the time to write the book, but we've gotten Jim Ely to write, to be the editor. And, we hope to have that book out in um, the spring of next year. Early uh, 2001? Yes. Have you ever had any ambition to write books? Oh, I have started all sorts of great projects. Um, what subjects would, uh, what kind of books would you write if you had? Well, mainly in law and in theology and um, particularly in Biblical interpretation, constitutional interpretation, which are close akin. All right. You used the terms justice and judge a few minutes ago. Uh, people call those of us who practice law, sometimes they refer to us as lawyers and sometimes they refer to us as attorneys. Uh, do you have some concern about that interchange, the same well, thing with justice know, and judges? Well, you've heard me say um, on more than one occasion that uh, um, an attorney is simply somebody who represents somebody else and there's no particularly, um, you know, nothing particularly fine about that. A lawyer, however, is someone who's learned in the law. Um, of course, um, and I may, may have been B. Gullett, but somebody's response to me when I said that, well, an attorney is a lawyer with a client. <laughs> <laughs> and B. Gullett is B.B. Uh, B. Gullett, uh, your uh, deceased former partner yes. in this firm. On these organizations, I've noticed uh, throughout there, you've been the uh, president, you've been the chairman, uh, you've been the founder. Uh, do you have administrative skills, uh, you think, that... Uh, that, uh, no. You wind up on time. I was a typical lawyer. Lawyers are not, don't make very good administrators. You remember when I was a managing partner of this law firm, you succeeded me and you did a much better job than I did. Well, I would, that's, I'd argue <laughs> with you on that. Well, obviously, a lot of people think that you do well because you have been appointed in those positions and uh, things have, have turned out well. Um, then you, you served, uh, then you finished serving on the Board of Bar Examiners in, in 1986. You graded your last paper. Uh, did that give you more time to do other things? Did that take up a good bit of your time? 
Oh, yes, that's, a, that's rather time-consuming. Uh, uh, you know, the, the law practice uh, is in and of itself tends to be time-consuming. Um, and in the uh, beginning in 1983, I began to represent AT&T in regulatory matters, and uh, off and on that has been re the representation of AT&T has taken a great bit of my time. Also, in connection with uh, professional organizations, I recall that you were an initiator of the Colleagues Program of the Nashville Bar Association. What's that about? Well. They, my friend Charlie Warfield was the president of the Nashville Bar Association, and he asked me to uh, um, head a committee to look into a mentoring program. And you know, most of the mentoring programs are built on the idea that there will be this young lawyer who will have this old lawyer that the young lawyer will um, feel free to call on for advice. Well, unless they've known one another, the young lawyer isn't about to call some old lawyer and ask him some question uh, of any significance. Uh, I just don't think that's a feasible way to do it. So uh, I guess in part influenced by my experience with the ends of court program, um, I, I came up with the idea that what you needed to do was to have small groups with lawyers of differing ages. You'd have a, uh, you know, lawyers over 20 years and lawyers of um, 10 years or so and young lawyers and then the youngest lawyers, the new lawyers. And in this mix, uh, you, you would do things together, you would eat together, you would uh, uh, have programs of some sort together and in this way you would become sufficiently familiar with one another where the young lawyer would feel free to call the old lawyer if they had some problem. And in addition, by this sort of formal structure, the young lawyer would be given some sort of a, uh, initiation into the mysteries of the practice. You know, there are currently two federal judges, Judge uh, Gilbert Merritt and Judge Todd Campbell, who take great pride in saying that they trained under you and that you taught them many things. Well, I don't know that Merritt would claim that he trained under me. But <laughs> Not to your face, but, but behind your back, he, he will concede that. And you, you, must, you must get satisfaction from, from uh, the standpoint that uh, they were in the law firm with you. And, um, yes, we've had, we've had a lot of uh, fine lawyers. Uh, um, who've been with us are those, uh, those and, and others as well who've gone on to uh, do um, uh, other positions. Right. Um, Judge Weldon White from this firm served yes, on the Tennessee we've, Supreme we've, Court. Uh, this firm has been an incubator of judicial talent. Judge Harry Phillips served on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Right. Plus um, Judge Merritt that we mentioned and now uh, Judge Todd Campbell. In view of that, and in view of the fact that that firm apparently has been an incubator of judges, you still never had an interest in being a judge? No, I think we've been over that. Hadn't I know, but I'm thinking, <laughs> have you thought about it, though? I'm saying yeah. it's it, it, quite unusual. Uh, so many people think you'd be such a, such a good judge. And um, you have no regrets about law practice, that you've stuck to law practice over the years. Is that correct? No, I don't have any regrets about that. At all. Tell me some. I, 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 you know, there would have been a many, many. Uh, you, you always have forks in your life. Uh, when I was in undergraduate school, um, one of my history professors uh, wanted to know whether I would be interested in pursuing um, further degrees in history, um, but I wasn't interested in that. Then, when I was in law school, uh, the dean, Dean Ray Forrester, called me in one day and asked me if um, I would like to have a fellowship to Yale for that SJD degree, advanced law degree. Um, and of course, the main reason for doing that is if you're going to pursue an academic career. Um, 
I gave that some thought. I went home and talked to my wife, who's usually very agreeable with whatever I want to do, been very supportive over the years, but she was not at all interested in my continuing to go to school. Um, and that settled that, I think. <laughs> that settled that. I really wasn't all that interested in myself for that matter. But uh, uh, And then the various moves that I'd made over the years, that you, you, you sometimes wonder how it would have been if you had made this choice of that. You told us earlier. No regrets. You told us earlier about uh, the representation you had of the uh, church when you were practicing law with Frank Clement. Recall any cases uh, subsequent to that. That uh, that uh, I'm thinking about the Watkins Institute case. Can you tell us a little bit about that? No, oh, I thought you were going to ask about the Baptist Sunday School Board. I represent the Baptist Sunday School Board. I tell you what, let's do. Let's ask about the Baptist Sunday School Board first. Then we'll get to Watkins. Tell uh, me about that. I represented the Baptist Sunday School Board in the tax controversies in the 60s and early 70s. Um, whether it's to be taxed or not? Yes. By yeah, the ad valorem tax, uh -huh. uh, whether that was. Um, the first of those cases, um, we won before the chancellor. We won in the Court of Appeals, and we lost in the Supreme Court, and I'm still mad about that. I don't think that decision was right even though my friend Judge Felt wrote the opinion. Um, now, the Watkins Institute, Watkins Institute is an interesting organization. You may know that uh, Sam Samuel Watkins, in about 1880-something, uh, left uh, some property in downtown Nashville uh, to the state of Tennessee in trust uh, for the creation of a school, Watkins Institute. Uh, the rent from the um, property was supposed to pay for the operation of, of the school. And that was the way basically the school functioned. There were not the charges for tuition were very low. Uh, then in the, they built a building in about 1890. Uh, by 1960 or 1950s, uh, that building had become obsolete and needed to be replaced. So the commissioners decided to replace the building. Uh, they needed to get a tenant for that new building. Who would be there? Who would be the best possible tenant that they could get? So they hired Mr. W.H. Criswell to get them a tenant. Mr. Criswell was a prominent real estate man in Nashville then. And Mr. Criswell found that tenant, W.T. Grant & Company. Now, of course, 12 years later, W.T. Grant & Company was in bankruptcy. Uh, they hired me to get the approval through the Chancery Court. Uh, we had to get the court to approve the issuance of the bonds. Um, and in order to do that, we needed the most eminent bond counsel that we could find. Uh, and I checked around and decided that the proper person for this, the person whose opinion on bonds, particularly bonds of an unusual governmental nature, would be accepted by anybody, was a lawyer in New York named John Mitchell, who was later, of course, Nixon's uh, attorney general. Uh, so 12 years later, uh, Mr. Mitchell was in disgrace and in jail, uh, which shows the point of that story is you can't never tell. Uh, the things that look like that they're the best today may well not turn out to be tomorrow. That's the grass is always greener <laughs> theory, I believe. Any other uh, interesting cases that you can recall? Oh, I guess I could think of, of many. If not, let me ask you this. You've been practicing law for 51 years, and you've had an opportunity to observe closely how lawyers practiced back when you began practicing and how the law is practiced today. Uh, can you compare them or contrast as far as the methods? Well, you know, not surprisingly, Back uh, as us old lawyers want to say, 
when I first came to the bar. <laughs> uh, they, uh, there were, what, 250, 300 at the most lawyers in Nashville. Mm -hmm. uh, and you knew, everybody knew everybody. Uh, so there was an attitude, and, and you knew who the scoundrels were, and there were always a few. Um, and, but most everybody, uh, you trusted. You didn't have any real concern about, and you were friendly enemies. Um, and that's, of course, no longer true. We've got, I don't know what now, 3,700, some such preposterous number of lawyers in Davidson County. Um, and uh, there's no way that you can know everybody, and no way that you can uh, have a real idea of, uh, uh, of what sort of people they are. So you get a more formal uh, approach to things. You've noticed a trend towards special specialization over the years. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, as I have, think I've indicated when I started practicing in for many years, uh, um, most lawyers uh, took whatever um, came in the door uh, that would pay. Uh, you didn't have the sort of specialization that you have now. Is being a lawyer more financially rewarding today than when you, pra when you started? I'm sure it is for some, but I don't know that it is for the general run. That's all such a relative thing. Yeah. Um, when, a, when a fancy hotel didn't cost but ten dollars to stay in. Um, and you know one of my criteria for measuring was how much a good cigar cost. Um, you could buy a good cigar back then for a quarter. Well a good cigar now probably cost you five dollars. Um, you, 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 you're just living in a different atmosphere. Well, let me ask you this. You've indicated from the very beginning that you were a timekeeper, which was yes. unusual somewhat uh, back when you started practicing law. Um, today, we talk a lot about the billable hour, that we, uh, our fees are based many times just solely on the billable hour. Any, uh, any observations on that? Yes, I think that's been one of the more unfortunate things that's uh, come pass in the way the law is practiced. Um, um, what a lawyer has to offer clients is judgment, not time. That, that apocryphal saying that they attribute to Abraham Lincoln about a lawyer having, you know, his stock of goods at time or whatever that was, uh, that's just nonsense. What a lawyer has got and what a lawyer has to offer is his, his or her judgment. And, you know, you can't measure that uh, on a time basis. You think that law schools could do a better job preparing young lawyers? <clears throat> do I think law schools? Do you think the law schools could do a better job of preparing young lawyers? Oh, everybody could always do a better job. Mm -hmm. um, I think legal education uh, has um, has been. Uh, I don't like to say too theoretical because you have to have theory and practice, but it has not it has not been sufficiently akin to the way life is lived. Um, and you know, if I were reforming it, instead of taking away a year, I'd add another year in which you divide it up into groups and the group, you gave a group upgrade to the group because that's the way you really do. You know, you, you, most of us are going to practice in some collegial setting where our success depends on the success of those around us. And we have to have the ability to work together and the ability to, to support one another uh, and if we're going to succeed. 
Well, I've noticed that in the mornings in the, this law firm, starting at about 8.30 in the lounge, you often hold court along with about 10 or 12 other lawyers talking about the issues of the day, many of which are not law related. Do you enjoy that time? Oh, sure. And that's in keeping with what you're talking about, yes. about collegiality. Yeah, you, 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 you have to know, or it helps anyway, to know one another, share. Now, during, throughout your career, you've been uh, actively involved in the organized bar activity, isn't that correct? Yes. When I started in the early 50s, uh, it would have been unthinkable not to go to the bar convention, the state bar convention. Um, this was just one of the things you did. Um, and, you know, in part, I suppose, that it was an organized effort because you had to be present to vote for president, and we used to have many contested ele elections for the presidency, and um, they'd get to vote out. But it was also, uh, you know, it gave you an opportunity to see people that you knew but you didn't often see. So there was a, uh, a healthy spirit to it. So you've always been active in the local bar association and the state bar and the, uh, and the American Bar Association, is that correct? I've always been a member. I haven't been all that active in the American Bar Association. I have um, been, been uh, not nearly as active in that as I have in the state and local. The, uh, also belong to the American Judicature Society, mm -hmm. um, the American College of Real Estate Lawyers, and the American Academy of Appellate Lawyers. And, I, and um, I guess the most distinguished thing was the American Law Institute. Yeah. You're a life member of that, isn't that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about time for the uh, Nashville Bar Association to have its annual banquet that will be coming next week. And there's always a tradition there uh, that people look forward to when they get up when the uh, secretary gets up and indicates that he or she is about to begin to read the minutes. And that's, that declaration sets you off. <laughs> well, and, I and, inherited that tradition. And tell us uh, what... Har Harlan Dodson has uh, been my immediate predecessor in that, that is moving to dispense with the reading of the minutes. So um, uh, I've been doing it most of the most every meeting for the last oh, 25 years, I guess. And uh, get a big breath now, and for the benefit of posterity, well, tell us how you make that motion. We are always in a large <laughs> room, and I have been blessed with a large <laughs> voice. So um, I will say, Mr. President, I move that we suspend with the reading of the minutes or something to that effect. And there would be applause throughout the Congress, yes. throughout the audience. Well, what do you like to do in your spare time when you're not uh, practicing law? Well, that's varied over the years. Um, I, you know, in my youth, I enjoyed playing golf, but I didn't have the temperament for that. I gave that up. I enjoyed gardening. Um, I enjoyed running a chainsaw. And um, my grinder shredder chipper, of which I've had several over the years, um, cleaning up a pile of brush. Um, you know, I live in the woods, so that sort of thing. But since I have um, had my cancer, I have not been able to do the sort of things that I uh, used to do. But one thing I guess is constant. I'm a compulsive reader, and I read. Um, what kind and of things? do that. What kind of things do you like to read? Oh, I, I don't know how many magazines I take. I'm interested in politics and history, and um, literature, and theology. Um, philosophy. You've indicated that uh, you've never written any books, although you had the, the urge. Uh, 
Oh, I have not have more than an urge. I have started uh, um, a substantial number. I almost always have got some project going. I, the way my, and this is a, a, a terrible way to be, but I, I get this great idea. I get started. I write, uh, you know, first part of it, get into it. Then I get busy and I put it aside. And then I come back to it and I think, that's not worth doing. And so I've never finished anything. You know, I understand that the uh, first Vanderbilt Law Review article cited by the United States Supreme Court that you were the author. Is that correct? That's right. An article about evidentiary privilege was cited about 1953. What are your children doing today? What do they do? My, my older daughter, Mary, uh, she and her husband teach at an orthodox seminary in South Canaan, Pennsylvania, which is, uh, um, oh, 30 miles or so um, east of Scranton. Uh, she and her husband were both converted to Eastern Orthodoxy um, and teach there. Um, of course, Eastern Orthodoxy, this is a basically stems from the Russian branch of the Eastern Orthodoxy. That's about as far away from country Baptist as you can get, but um, they're very happy there and um, very devout. My second daughter, Elizabeth, is a painter and she teaches at Watkins Institute. My Son, Will, uh, is a um, producer of multimedia educational materials. Any of your children ever consider law practice? Not as far as I'm aware. Are you a doting grandfather? I only have one grandchild. I have a, I'm going to have another one next spring, but um, I, and she lives in uh, off up in Pennsylvania, but they come to visit and. I, I don't when I have the opportunity. <laughs> well, in addition to your practice of law and uh, your involvement in bar-related activities, uh, you've also been quite active and interested in, in church activities in Nashville. Is that correct? Well, I have, I have been I've taught Sunday school or Bible study uh, for uh, beginning in 1951 and uh, thereafter up until about four or five years ago um, and I'm back doing it part-time now even. So I have, um, I've always had an interest in religion and always had uh, an interest in the life of the local church, the church where I belong. And you've served in leadership positions there? Yes, I, and I have um, uh, written the uh, basic, I was chair of the committee that wrote the statement of faith, uh, um, wrote the bylaws, all that sort of stuff. You know, to, to have never completed any books, you have written a wide array of articles and documents, haven't you? Oh, sure. If I could, I could truthfully say that I'm a writer. Don't you think being a good writer is a good preparation to be a lawyer? Oh, sure. Verbal skills, obviously, a lawyer needs verbal skills. You know, over the years, you've seen the law practice changing with technology. Uh, it's the day of the computer. It's the day of electronic research. Uh, you use the computer? Do you yes. use electronic uh, research? Yes. Uh, I you, don't, I find that it is, it, it doesn't replace the books for me. Um, after I find exhausted what I can find in the books, then I'll go uh, use it. The, the main problem with the electronic research, uh, the Westlaw, which we have particularly, is it's too expensive. Um, and it 
it's easier to run up a big bill far beyond what it'd be worth to the client. Do you enjoy legal research? Oh yes, I enjoy research, enjoy brief writing, enjoy drafting, enjoy organizing as I think it said earlier, I think I enjoy organizing and presenting complex ideas. We were talking a few minutes ago about your being an avid reader. Uh, you periodically read several daily newspapers, do you not? Well, I miss the banner. But <laughs> uh, sports and obituary as much as anything. Um, but yeah, I read the Tennessee and I read the, the um, Wall Street Journal, read the New York Times, read the Commercial Appeal most of the days. What things interest you in, uh, in reading? Uh, current events? Oh, sure. I follow the, the um, political battles. Um, and uh, I'm interested in the economic uh, news, um, you know, all the way down to the human interest story. Val, is there anything in the practice of law that you haven't done that you'd still like to do? Well, I hadn't thought about that. Um, I, 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 you know, you say talk about regrets. Mm -hmm. I suppose that that if I look back and say, well, what would you have done differently? One of the things I think that I would like to have done differently is to have had more jury trial experience. I tried a few jury cases, but I never did have the depth of experience uh, in, in trying jury cases. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's a real challenge. I don't know that I would have been good at it. Um, you need a common touch, and I'm not sure I've got the common touch. You know, it looks like most cases are settled today before trial. Oh, was, sure. Was the that position practice? Was that true changed. when you first began? No. 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 You tried cases. Was Chancery Court different when you first began? Oh, definitely. Chancery Court, the, you know, one of the things that was so different is the general attitude. Um, in the circuit court, cases, uh, motions, for example, were argued. In the chantry court, they were discussed. And now, and Gibson footnote, you know, that says that the old famous footnote that you should you should argue the um, um, you should argue the law to the uh, justice of the peace because they don't know any law. You should argue the law mostly to circuit judges because they know a little law. You should argue facts to chancellors because they know most of the law. <laughs> and then you should focus almost wholly on the facts to the appellate court because they know all the law, which of course is just the opposite of the way things work out in practice. Do you have any position on the use of mediation to settle cases and disputes? Well, I think it's, uh, it's uh, probably a healthy thing. Um, to, um, to avoid litigation. Litigation is sort of like a major surgery. Um, you, you don't want to undertake, uh, you don't want to undergo major, major surgery, uh, and you don't want to undergo major litigation unless you can avoid it. Yeah. Can't avoid it, I should say. Val, you've been practicing half a century. If you could uh, live your life over, would you still want to be a lawyer? I can't answer that question. I, I can't live my life over. Um, it, uh, I, what, I do your, not regret being a lawyer. All right. I guess that's the best answer I can give to that. Is there anything else you wish I'd ask you or you'd like to tell us about? that we haven't covered. Well, you didn't ask me the question you told me you were going to ask. Namely? 
<laughs> you said you were going to ask me, uh, um, well, how did you put it? Um, what I would like to be remembered, how I would like to be remembered. That's my last question. And I'm, I'm leading up to that. Oh, you're leading up to that. Uh, well, that, no, I, well that's, I, that's the only question you told me you were going to ask that, me. That's the old. And so I've been thinking some about that's it. That's the old Barbara Walters question. <laughs> so Val Sanford, just to make it official, how would you like to be remembered? Well, as I have indicated, you you told me you were going to ask me that, so I've given that a little thought. Um, and it's a difficult question for me because I don't agree with the question. Uh, the the uh, the, the first thing is, um, I ain't dead yet. <laughs> and what I might be remembered by may be, may well be something that has not yet occurred. It may be nothing more than how I died, or it may be all kinds of things, but I don't think that that's a question for a man in my position today, even though I'm a whole lot closer to the end than most folks are. Well, let me ask then you. Then I'm not through. Okay. Because I've been, as I say, I've been thinking <laughs> about this. I noticed that. And and the the uh, the uh, second reason is because that question is inconsistent with the basic way that I think one should look at life. Uh, as a Christian, I think we should live life proleptically, that is, in anticipation of the fulfillment of the promises on which our faith is based. So that's one perspective that would be inconsistent with thinking about how you want to be remembered. Another perspective would be from the perspective of how you should live your life as a lawyer. Um, and my favorite short expression of that uh, is taken from uh, remarks of uh, Sir William Osler, uh, who was a famous uh, physician, my father's idol, um, in an essay called Equinimitas, Equanimity, uh, advising young doctors. And he told them, take no thought for the morrow. Live neither in the past nor the future, but let each day's task absorb your widest ambitions and energies. And I think that's how you ought to look at how you sh should live as a lawyer. Whatever the task of the day is, that's what you devote your attention to. You don't worry about whether you're going to have a case tomorrow, and you don't worry about that case you lost yesterday, much less gloat about the one you won yesterday. You think about, you concern yourself, you focus on the task at hand. And then the third perspective, which is inconsistent, is the perspective of an old man. And uh, I was thinking about the various things in literature about that I had a best attitude for an old man. And my favorite there is Tennyson's Ulysses, uh, which is a favorite of many people of my generation anyway. Uh, and it's an old man's poem, and the last lines, they begin that passage that begins, uh, Come, my friends, it is not too late to seek a newer world. And then the last line, <coughs> to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. And if you put all three of those together, I think you can see why I don't think it's proper to ask what I would like to be remembered by. And may it please the court, I will withdraw that question. <laughs>
<laughs> and on that lofty note, we'll conclude this discussion, which I've enjoyed immensely.